All right. Hello, everyone. This is Circuit Python Weekly for Monday, April tenth, twenty twenty-three. This is time of the week where we get together to talk about all things Circuit Python. I'm Liz. I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on Circuit Python and other things. Uh, Circuit Python is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Circuit Python development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and Circuit Python, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafruit.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the hashtag CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. 11 a.m. rather, Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meeting via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPython Nista's Discord role. There is a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. The file notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link to the next meeting's notes document in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes stock so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. So this meeting is held in five parts. First part is community news. Let's look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python on microcontrollers newsletter. Second part is status CircuitPython, libraries, and Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from our status updates. Third part is hug reports. Hug reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. Fourth part is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to report on what we've been up to. Take a couple minutes to talk about what you've been doing last week, since the last meeting, and what you'll be up to over the next week. And the fifth part is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that covers the how the meeting will go. And with that, we'll get started with community news. And this week, uh, there's a new Raspberry Pi Python code editor. Uh, beta software is now available that allows one to run, write and run Python code right in the browser. Uh, another cool item in the newsletter I saw was a playable and edible Dungeons and Dragons cake. Uh, and I think most notably, Circuit Python Show podcast has returned today uh, with guest Danny Staple. I listened this morning. It was a wonderful episode. Uh, this and more is available in our weekly Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which it goes out via email on Tuesday mornings. Visit adafruit.com. Da- sorry, visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter, and thanks to Anne for putting the newsletter together. If you have any Python on hardware projects to share or find content you'd like to see included, please consider contributing to the newsletter. You can open a PR on GitHub, uh, mention Anne underscore engineer on Twitter with hashtag CircuitPython, or email cpnews at adafruit.com with a link. And also, if you have gotten off the Twitter, uh, the hashtag CircuitPythonAlmacedon is also a viable option. Uh, but that is the community news. Uh, and next up is going to be a state of CircuitPython, libraries, and Blinka. And we're going to go to Scott to read the core. Uh, sorry, I will read the overall first. Um, there are 27 pull requests merged by 18 authors. Uh, 11 reviewers, and there were 15 closed issues by 9 people, and 12 opened by 10 people. And now we will go to Scott to hear about the core. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> numbers for the core. 13 pull requests merged uh, from 11 different authors. Uh, Waptang, Tess, Tihes uh, are new names to me there. Uh, we had five reviewers, uh, which is more than normal, which is great too. Lady Ada, Microdev, and Dave Putz are um, infrequent reviewers, so thank you to them. Uh, we have 23 open pull requests, um, which is not too bad. It's under that one page threshold, which is great. Uh, a number of them are drafts, and a number of them are brand, brand new, which is great too. 
Um, issues wise, we had eight closed issues by six people, five open by four people, so a good number of people involved, and we're net down issues, which is great. Uh, we have a total of 631 open issues. We have eight active milestones. We have no issues open for 80X, which is great and the highest priority for us uh, funded by Adafruit to work on. Um, we have 15 open issues for 8.1, um, which we plan on triaging this week uh, to determine how to get 8.1 stable and out the door. Um, we have 68 open issues uh, in the bug category for 8x, um, which maybe we should triage as well. Um, and then we have 20 open issues for 9.0, which will likely be our next uh, kind of stable release after 8.1. Um, and that's basically it for the core. Thank you so much, Scott. And now we're going to hear from Paul Cutler today for the libraries. Thanks, Liz. Uh, for the libraries, we had eight pull requests merge from seven authors with six reviewers. Um, we had 48, we have 48 total open pull requests. We had five closed issues by four people and seven open by six people. We have a total of 607 open issues with 73 marked as a good first issue. For the libraries, the PyPI weekly stats, we had total libraries downloaded with 73,292 PyPI downloads over 310 libraries. And you can see the top 10 libraries in the notes. And for the week, we had three new libraries. That includes Adafruit CircuitPython Wii Classic, CircuitPython Async Buzzer, in CircuitPython BMI 160, which I believe is a sensor. And that's it for the libraries. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next, we're going to hear about Blinka. Um, I believe Melissa's out, so I can read. Uh, there were six pull requests merged by four authors and four reviewers. There are six open pull requests, uh, two closed issues by one person, and zero new issues. There are currently 93 open issues. Uh, for PyPy downloads in last week, it was 13,000. 414 uh, Pi Wheels downloads in the last month. There are 16,432, and number of supported boards is 101. Uh, and that is the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka. So next up is going to be Huggerports. And Huggerports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you are text only or are missing the meeting, I'll read your notes and then um, when I get to you in the list. So I will start. So this week, Huggerport Catney for a good chat last week. Uh, Huggerport to Carter for U2IF resources and assistance and a group hug. Uh, next is Seagrover, who is text only. And he has a hug report to Foamy Guy for introducing bitmap tools in one of their streams. It made a huge difference in simplifying and improving performance for graphic object animations. Uh, to Kmatch and the 12 contributors to a surprisingly useful bitmap tools module, exceptional design and implementation, I'm still discovering all it has to offer, and Catney for a discussion about thermal camera features and operational characteristics and other interesting subjects uh, has given me a new perspective about some useful improvements. Uh, and next is Charles B, who is also text only, and they have a group hug. And then next is Dan. Okay, uh, thanks to Scott uh, for fixing a Paulson problem. Um, there was some issue with background tasks uh, happening. You can schedule background tasks or you can do them every tick. And it, there were just an incomplete fix of that. So thank you for fixing that, Scott. And thanks to Jeff, who's not here for a bunch of really wonderful additions to the Synth.io uh, built-in library, which people who are interested in th synthesizers are, are extremely interested in. We'll see where that goes. That will be great. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. And I'm also excited about Synth.io. Uh, next, I'll read for David Glau. Uh, Hug report Niradoc for porting LilyGo Twatch 2020 v3 to CircuitPython, and to Foamy Guy for his streaming on TR Cowbell usage and coding. And then next is DJ Devin 3, who is text only. Hug report to Niradoc, Dan, Toddbot, Betty2, Deshipu, and David G for helping to resolve the alphanumeric backpack I squared C issue from last week's In the Weeds topic. Uh, Dan and Katney for helping me with Git. Anic Data for helping me troubleshoot a new LED board issue. 
and Katney for the excellent RFM 69 Learn Guide. One of the largest guides I've read yet, very well documented, can tell you put a lot of effort into that one. And next we're going to hear from Foamy Guy. All right, thanks Liz. Um, first up for me, a hug report for Jose David, who has submitted a bunch of new libraries to the community bundle recently, as well as pops up in uh, reviews across lots of other libraries uh, as well. So thanks to Jose for that. Um, hug report to Katni for a, a quest uh, to add some interesting functionality to the conference badge uh, and snake game from last year. Uh, it's a thing that I enjoy working on, so uh, I'm happy to, uh, to help add some new stuff to that. Um, DJ Devin uh, 3 hug report, thanks for sharing a tip about uh, known issue with certain models of NVMe storage drives, uh, the particular models that I happen to have. Uh, so that was good to know about some uh, ongoing issues there. And a uh, group hug for everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and next is from Jepler, who is away, uh, but says, hi from Boulder, Colorado. Take care all and group hug. And if you scroll up, uh, you'll see some fun photos that he shared as well. Uh, next is Jose David, who I think I am reading for. Uh, Katney for all the help in Discord. Uh, T. Franks for documentation in the for the PN523 library. And Furbrain for adding the asynchronous buzzer library to the community library. And next we'll hear from Katney. I have a lot. Um, so first up, to uh, hug to Crayola for uh, working on a 3D printed case for my in progress conference badge. To Foamy Guy for helping with me with badge code and the snake game that's going to be included. To see Grover for writing a slimmed down version of the improved thermal camera software to also be included on my badge. To Brent for looking into uh, whether Adafruit IO works as I imagined it does. And whether my plans for the badge mode of my badge are being dashed, um, it turns out that Adafruit IO does not work how I thought it should. So my plans are being dashed. Uh, so I have to come up with a new plan. Um, to TechDirect for handling a thing over the weekend and seeing it through. To the Discord helpers, uh, that's everybody in one of the helpers roles, um, for a very thoughtful discussion over the weekend. To Phil and Lamore for helping me put together two extra special items to donate to the Pie Ladies auction this year at PyCon, um, to Mr. Certainly for help gathering content for my upcoming talk, and a preemptive hug for the further help I expect to happen over the next eight days, to Toddbot for some help with some uh, audio cable questions, to you Liz for the same thing, to John Park for agreeing to help me with some Adobe Premiere questions this week so I can successfully edit a video of my talk quickly during uh, PyCon, and to uh, Tammy Makes Things, Toddbot, uh, Tectric, and John Park for contributing an applicable personal moment to my upcoming talk and a group hug for everyone. Thank you so much. And next is Mark Gambler, who's lurking. Uh, hug report to Lady Ada and everyone else at Adafruit that puts board schematics in the learn guide. I was using them the last couple of days to learn more to help me start my own project. And then we will hear from Scott. Hello. Okay. Uh, uh, hug report to Dave Futz for debugging the pulse and breakage on ESP, which triggered this thing about the background tasks that Dan was talking about. Um, thanks to Dave for looking into that. It's Dave's awesome <laughs> picking up bugs and, and running them down. I really appreciate it. And then uh, hug report to Apple Cuckoo uh, for the code of conduct link fix that they did along with a documentation fix about URandom on NRF. Thank you. Uh, next I'll mm -hmm. read for Tectric. Uh, Katney for help over the weekend. All the Discord helpers for always helping out in a number of ways in the Discord server and a group hug. And then finally we'll hear from T. Franks. T. Franks, are you present? I'm not seeing them. So I'll I don't. Read. I don't um, think so. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Katni and Jay Posada for helping me over over the issues building RTD output in PyCharm for local reading and review, and that was hug reports. Uh, next up is status updates, and status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I will start, and we'll go through the list alphabetically. I call on you, take a couple minutes, talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting, and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. 
This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can move it to in the weeds. And with that, I will get started. Uh, and this past week, I've actually been doing more like circuit Python work than I normally do. I've been working with U2IF firmware and Blinka. Uh, U2IF lets you use RP2040 boards with Blinka and desktop circuit desktop Python. Uh, so Carter's done a lot of work with this previously and added a few Adafruit boards like the RP2040 Cutie Pie um, the, and the just regular Feather. Um, so I just added the upcoming Think Ink Feather, which is going to have um, a, a port to plug in an e-paper display directly. Uh, and we'll be adding a couple of the, of the other RP2040 Bones Feathers. So there's the uh, Radio Feathers and uh, the other one's going to be the CAN Bus Feather. Uh, so related, uh, Lady Ada asked um, if I could try to add support for the seven color e-ink displays to the CircuitPython EPD library. That's the library we're using uh, with Blinka. And I have the display refreshing, but only displaying in black and white, which kind of goes against, uh, you know, the purpose of having seven colors. Uh, so no colors yet and resolution might be a little off. So still work in progress, but I think I'm close just because I am able to get to refresh and do uh, all that kind of stuff uh, as expected. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, and then next, I will read for C. Grover. Uh, continue to exercise bitmap tools for improving the precision VCO's graphical UI. Uh, finally broke out of sandbox mode and will be wrapping up the prototype soon. Found two PCB changes that will be needed as a result and have an internal debate about choosing purple or after dark Arsh Park boards. A happy dilemma. I've had that dilemma before as well. Uh, spending some time today creating a small memory footprint version of the original Pi Gamer Pi Badge thermal camera should be fairly straightforward. Famous last words. Also researching a recently discovered issue with 8.0.5 and display text not recognizing the width of a space character in a BDF font and throwing an error. We'll run some more tests and submit an issue if it turns out to be other than a cockpit error. Uh, found a bunch of nails around the house and yard needing to pressure washer hammer yesterday. A uh, trigger hand is a little sore today. And now we'll hear from Dan. Okay. Um, Scott and I are going to do a have a meet and, and triage the existing bugs for 810 and 88X so we can get an 810 out and figure out what we really need to fix for 8XX. And. Um, the other thing is that the um, BNO055, and there's some other uh, sensors like the BNO085, don't do ITC, IP, I2C uh, that well. They do clock stretching, and they make they have some other errors in their I2C implementation. And so it causes the RT1011, that is on, which is on the Metro M7 board, not to work properly with the BNO055, even though the peripheral on the board on the chip should do clock stretching. So after discussing this, we're just going to try to put some fixes in the library to work around this problem. It is a known problem with these sensors that they make mistakes in their implementation of the I2C protocol and some chips handle this and some chips don't. So uh, hopefully we'll get it working on these chips on the RT1011. That's so my thing. Next thing to do is to fix the library or make the library do workarounds. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, next, I'll be reading for DJ Devin. Uh, I was, it was really neat to see a lot of people participating to help figure out the alphanumeric backpack I squared C issue after last week's In the Weeds topics. Dan did a fantastic job troubleshooting the electronic circuit and helping to get I squared C working. The culprit was initially hidden because I was using the ESP32 S2, which has an onboard pull up just enough to pull up one backpack, but not both. I switched to the RP2040 Feather and the issue using I squared C scan became more obvious. The pull ups on the backpacks simply weren't working. A bodge wire from VDD to VIO is all that was required. I would have never figured that out on my own. A small batch of new LED boards arrived I designed called Bleeding Rainbow. That's actually a band name, um, and so very cool. Uh, it's a NeoPixel stick made of 50 WS2812C RGB LEDs from World Semi. They're tiny 2 millimeter LEDs and the smallest I could find with a built-in LED driver. Only red works at 3.3 volts. They require 5 volts for RGB. Thanks to Anecdata for helping to figure it out. I'm happy to report they work great with CircuitPython and the board is cool to touch after hours of running. You can use one on USB power, but not two. 
windows through an error by exceeding the USB power rating and shut off access to my feather completely. Power hungry little things. It removed the feather from windows and no amount of power cycling helped. I had to use device cleanup and reboot the PC to get the feather show up again. With an external 5 volt power supply, they will be replacing the NeoPixel strips inside my mail boombox. Uh, the house I moved into last year had an old gooseneck faucet, probably original to the house. It broke and sprayed water five feet in the air, replaced it with a modern one that has a detachable head. No leaks so far. That's good. Uh, and next we're going to hear from Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, thanks, Liz. Um, this week, uh, or I should say over the past week, uh, I had a little bit less time uh, to work on some CircuitPython stuff than typical. I have still been doing some swapping of hardware components inside of my main PC, uh, and I did end up opting to uh, install a new OS because uh, I could not get the previous one back to booting. Uh, but I'm pretty much up and running again uh, on that, so I should have a, a path forward, and I also have the backup computer, uh, as it is now dubbed, set up that can do all the same stuff uh, in case I still have any more issues. Um, the work that I did do over the past week was looking into um, using two displays with Display.io. Um, there was uh, some updates to Display.io API a little while back, maybe a few months ago, and I think that those updates actually were the root cause of some trouble on devices with two displays. Uh, like the Monster Mask is the only one that's really built in like this. I did submit a fix for one of the issues um, affecting that device and any others that use two displays, but I think there's still some weirdness going on. Um, so I have been trying to trace through everything that happens, especially when you control C reset and uh, control D to run CodePy again to figure out what remaining issues there are uh, on that device. So getting closer, but still have some looking into it to do. Um, I have, uh, or I should say, I will be working on some updates to the conference badge and snake game that I developed last year around uh, PyCon, uh, adding capabilities to launch uh, arbitrary external scripts um, as defined by the user. So this way you can kind of uh, show off whatever other CircuitPython um, project you want within the badge with just a couple of button clicks. Um, and then uh, this morning I also did do a round of catching up on community bundle PRs. There was a couple in there that needed to be merged from main. Uh, so I got all of those uh, updated and ready to go, moved in. So um, that's what I have been up to. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. And next we'll hear from Katni. Hello. So this week I am wrapping up the RFM 69 guide. We published it without the... CircuitPython Essentials pages because um, obviously the rest of the guide was was in place and the Essentials are a happy addition but not necessary to an original guide. So I've been working on those. Um, I have four left. Uh, two of those only require code, so that is already written. Um, and then I'm going to be adding one more page that has an RFM69 basic demo. Um, of two boards talking to each other, maybe the button does something to the LED on the other one, etc. And then once that's wrapped up, I'll be starting the RFM 95 guide, which is same as the um, the RFM 69, but the physical radio module looks different. So all the images will need to be replaced, and uh, the software is different. So any RFM specific code will need to also be updated. So the RFM95 guide should go faster because I can do a lot of copying um, pages from the RFM69 guide and then just replacing images in code. Um, but uh, something always comes up. So <laughs> it, it should be faster, uh, but it might not. Um, then I will be this week wrapping up um, anything else that any other loose ends that need to be tied. Um, because I am preparing for PyCon this year. Um, some of the things I need to do in no particular order are uh, finish up the PyBadge uh, badge case and the software. And thank you again to um, Tim and C. Grover uh, for your help with everything. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do this on my own. Um, I am still gathering hardware, etc., for the open spaces and sprints, um, filling in some gaps. I misplaced a bin from last year that has a bunch of stuff in it that I need. 
Um, and it's, it's gone. It's disappeared. I had it in January and it's, it's just, it's gone. So I wrote it off and, and started working around it. Um, I need to test my recording setup because I'm giving a talk at the education summit, which happens, uh, before the conference and, um, they don't record talks and a bunch of people expressed interest in seeing it. So I'm going to try to record it myself and release it that way. Um, I need to actually write the talk for the Education Summit. Um, and there's plenty more, but those are the four things I could think of uh, when I was writing this up. So um, I'm going to talk more about PyCon in the uh, in the weeds, um, but that's what I've got for now. Awesome. Thanks, Katni. And next we'll hear from Scott. Hello. Uh <clears throat> I was working on the IMXRT, um, but I burned myself out with the 1015. Um, there's these really weird errors where it just like ends up in the ROM code or the debugger stops working. and It's just really frustrating. Um, I was talking about improving the flash stuff, but I also realized that I probably can't do the XIP mode I was execute in place mode I was excited about uh, because the data sheet says there's no way to exit it. Um, which we would need to do in order to like erase and program CircuitPy. Um, but I, I got my DVI feather. Um, I, I switched off the IMXRT stuff, um, and I got my DVI feather on Friday, and I was curious about getting that working in CircuitPython. Um, I made pretty good progress. I got it all kind of set up, and I got it compiling, but it doesn't work. Um, so I'm going to need to break out the debugger and or some printfs to figure out um, how to how to get the second core running um, well. Uh, but speaking up, <laughs> speaking of not working, last night I was going to just run something on my desktop, only to find that the root file system had gone into a read-only mode, uh, which is not great, <laughs> not great at all. Uh, it boots all the way to the desktop, but nothing works um, because it's in read-only mode. So uh, I think a lot of my data is there. I've copied it to a spinning hard drive. Um, I tried to run the repair, but it didn't didn't actually fix any of the issues. So uh, I've got another drive coming today that I'm going to copy all the files off of um, that that I can, and then hopefully use that and and hopefully be on my way. Uh, so that's going to be my day to day probably um, once it gets here, and then. Uh, I'm going to keep working on the Feather DVI code because we're pretty excited about having Display I.O. on a DVI display. So that's it for me. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. And I'm very excited about that DVI code and uh, wish you luck with your computer issues. Um, ah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and finally, I will read for Tectric. Last week, finished up some Arduino things and now resuming all my CircuitPython work that was on temporary hold. Uh, this week, catching up on some PR reviews, prototyping how the RP2040JSCI will work, and looking at some Adabot upgrades patches that were identified a while ago. And that concludes status updates. So next is going to be In the Weeds. And In the Weeds is an opportunity for long-form discussions that either come out of status updates or the folks have identified ahead of time. If you have any in the weeds topics, please make sure they get added while we're discussing other things. So we're not waiting around to see if anyone has any topics. But uh, today we actually do have two topics. So first we will go to Scott uh, with their first topic. Thanks, Liz. Um, I, I threw this in last week and I'm not sure it's super relevant, but um, <clears throat> I wanted to bring it up anyway. So somebody was using the web workflow and deep sleep. And the way that deep sleeps traditionally worked with workflows is that um, because you're deep sleeping and you're optimizing for power, you typically want to be really fast at waking up because the, the shorter amount of time you're awake, the less power you use. Um, and so typically with workflows, including USB, we won't start it up when you're waking from deep sleep. Um, however, this person thought that was a bug and they actually made a bull request change how it works so that the web workflow will start up after deep sleep. Um, I'm not sure whether that's the right thing or not, um, but I wanted us to have a discussion about it. Um, their point, I think, was that like, if I'm on Wi-Fi and I'm waking up, one, I want to access it, and two, 
I'm going to connect to Wi-Fi, so I'm okay paying the penalty of starting it up anyway. Um, which is kind of, I think the current state of 8.1 is that it will, it will start the Wi-Fi workflow again. Um, what do people think of that? I think maybe we should make it configurable at least, but... Yeah, I would definitely agree with configurable. I think sounds nice if it could be a setting inside of the Tommel or however you would have to tell it true or false, but somewhere where you could set it that way, uh, people who want to save power can do that, and uh, people who want to edit through the uh, network can do it that way as well. If if right now you can just comment out the lines in the Tommel, so is that do we need a separate boolean or just? Right, you're saying you could just turn off web workflow. Yeah. Mm. Like, like it's sort of like, well, right. It's it's whether you you could always turn it on or off by commenting it in or out. You could also have a disable so that it, you only have to change one character or something like that. But. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure the Tommel's the right place because Mark Mark is pointing out a, what I think is a pretty good use case, which is like if you make it configurable, you could do Wi-Fi every five minutes, but take a reading every minute. Uh -huh. So make it supervised at runtime or something. So yeah, but then you have to start it up late. Yeah, start up at late, and you have to preserve memory. Yeah. I wonder if it's better as a boot.py thing. Like, is it started before boot.py or not? It shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, it, um, I don't think it is. I, I think it started after, after boot.py. Um, well, it would be simple to add another Boolean. Right. And maybe, do you think we need a specific Wi-Fi Boolean, or do we want to say, like, start workflows or... Remote workflow. Yeah. I mean, do we want do we want it to be a generic, like, yes, I want, I want us... I'm, I'm, I could check, I know I'm coming out of deep sleep, and I want to set the... I want to change the default from false to true that says start the workflows. I think like, that I think do right, that I don't way. think we need both because I it's hard to imagine a case where you want to enable like if you're going to use the web workflow and the BLE workflow you would have entries for both and you would turn them both on or off and you would it just doesn't that doesn't seem like something you'd you'd want to bother to control you can control that through the toml file so it's less it's so you, less so code. So just one one flag for all workflows. Yeah, just one workflow for there was one flag for remote workflow. I think would be. I mean, somebody might complain. Oh, I want to turn them on and off. But right, but your your point is that for workflows in general, you use the Toml to pick the one that you want starting up and off. Um, you can pick that in the Toml. Right. Right. Um, so, so all we only need a, a flag for startup. right. I mean, so, you could also have web workflow and BLE workflow, right? So, yeah, but I'd ra I'd rather just have like a generic workflow thing. Yeah, and I wouldn't say workflow. I mean, too. I would say remote workflow because you do have a workflow. It's just through CircuitPy or something like you know, like there's always some kind of workflow. So that's why I would distinguish but, it. But you don't have you like USB doesn't start up after a deep sleep, and in fact you don't want to because it will prevent subsequent deep sleeps. Oh, I see what you're saying. I see, I see, I see. Right, like, and this is this is why I made the the, this is why I made web workflow not start up. It's because that's exactly what. Right, what, it's like USB I see. It's do. like the K other case. Yes. Right, like, which is why I'm trying to make it, like, standardize it across workflows, regardless. 
Is it possible to use the deep sleep memory to hold a flag so that you could say what to start up after wake up from deep sleep? There is usually some. I was assuming the user could use the deep sleep memory to do it. Yes. So in in boot in boot.py, we just need to have a way of saying start up workflows or not. Right. So you could just have a start workflow. It's a, be a function rather than a. Well, I don't. I don't want it to be a function because that because we're not going to start it while boot.py is running. Oh, I see what you're saying. All right. Enable workflow. I mean, we have a bunch right. of functions. Yeah. Right. And it would default to false. And you could also do that based on a button push or something like that. Or so, deep sleep memory state. Yeah. yeah. Either case, you might you might want to. You could imagine a use case where you're not even worried about deep sleep. It's just that you want to enable it or disable it based on whether a button is pushed. Right. Which is the advantage of boot.py. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So I'll file an issue about this, and we should probably do it for 8.1. Yeah. Considering that the PR that I linked to changes the behavior for 8.1. Yeah. So we should change it back, but make it conditionalized. Right. OK. All right. I'll file an issue for that. All right. Uh, and next, we are going to hear from Katni. Hello again. So PyCon 2023 is coming up very soon. Um, I personally leave uh, a week from this Wednesday. Um, the conference itself is uh, the 21st to the 23rd. Um, that's uh, Friday through Sunday. And then there's development sprints afterwards for four days. Um, as for what Adafruit is up to, we will be hosting open spaces during the conference. Um, we're looking at uh, between uh, 1, 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. each day, uh, but I have to make sure that's even possible uh, once we're there, and the location is unknown until they put up a, um, a board as the conference begins and you, you know, put up there when you want, where you want to host. Um, so keep keep an eye on the Adafruit blog if you're if you are going to be there and are interested in uh, where and when those uh, open spaces end up being. Um, following the conference, we'll be hosting three days of development sprints, which is an opportunity for folks to contribute to um, the CircuitPython project, um, and or uh, just have a simple introduction to CircuitPython. Everybody's welcome. Doesn't matter what level of expertise you have or don't have. Um, and so that'll be uh, the 24th through the 26th. Um, I should mention that the open spaces are basically an introduction to CircuitPython via the Circuit Playground Express. Um, I will be bringing a bunch of fun extras to attach to your Express if you get beyond um, all of the features that are built into it. And um, again, everyone's welcome to attend. Um, and we will still have all that uh, during the sprints. So basically, um, we can still accommodate folks who are new to everything and just want to dabble around. Um, I will be there from uh, the 20th through uh, the 27th. Um, on the 20th is the Education Summit, which is a pre conference event. I will be giving a talk there. Um, I don't know whether registration is even still open for it. So if you're attending um, and you're going to be there a day early, uh, you can check it out. Most of the time they can accommodate extra people. It's never been an issue. Um, otherwise, I am going to be trying to record that talk and then we'll post it and I can make a note in the um, CircuitPython dev uh, text channel on the Adafruit Discord when that is posted. Um, so we will obviously, uh, Jeff, Jeff and I are going to be there. Um, that's, uh, our very favorite, uh, Jeff Epler or Jepler. Um, and, uh, Jeff staying through the end of, uh, the Monday, uh, sprints. Um, I know, um, Tetric will also be there. 
Um, he will be helping us out with the open spaces and the first day of sprints as well. And then remotely on the second two uh, days of sprints. Um, so there's going to be a lot of, a, you know, a lot of, a lot of things going on. Um, it's all Python related, obviously. And, um, I'm really looking forward to it. I am in the middle of a uh, prep scramble, which is pretty much how it always goes. And um, if you are attending, please reach out to me in the CircuitPython-Dev channel. Um, just to let me know so we can make sure to meet up. And if uh, you, otherwise, if you're attending, feel free to just find us around the conference. Um, you'll be able to find us for sure during the open spaces, uh, but we'll be around. So um, you should be able to... Uh, find us at some point. Uh, we would really like to meet up with anybody who's going to be there. And um, if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Um, I can definitely help out at least with the stuff that we are hosting. I don't know everything about the conference uh, to answer general questions. Um, so that's it. I just wanted to cover that uh, because it's it's a week and a half away and um, I figure this is a good time to start discussing it and let everybody know what's going on. Um, I'm perfectly happy to accommodate remote folks during the development sprints um, if anybody wants to participate uh, but not from the conference um, feel free and uh, we will be able to chat on on discord and um, through uh, contribute through github obviously um, or if you want to be available to help other folks that's also excellent um, and if you do uh, please let me know that as well so i can uh, be aware to look out for you during uh, the sprints on Discord. Um, that's what I've got. Awesome. Thanks so much, Katni. I know you put a lot of work into PyCon every year, so looking forward to seeing how your talk goes and everything this year. I do put a lot of effort into it. <laughs> it's appreciated, so um, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so that ends in the weeds, uh, and we are going to go into the wrap-up. Uh, this has been CircuitPython Weekly for Monday, April 10th, 2023. Thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, if you would like to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It'll also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. It comes out tomorrow morning. The next meeting will be held next Monday, as usual, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. This meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafruit.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.